When they say, you know, you get 10 seconds to make a first impression. In our game, those 10 seconds decide whether you actually get the job or not. That first impression is the deciding factor. Time is the coefficient that, ev that, that solves everything. It's the magic fairy. If I said to you, I've got this fairy dust that I can sprinkle on your life and you will get anything you want. Like, would you do it? Time is that thing. And the challenge becomes, can you outlast the pain? <laughs>is an actor who over the past 20 years has worked and hustled and grinded his way up from homeless man number two to earning a BAFTA nomination for best male comedy performance for his role in the British TV show, Home. Formerly a member of the Royal Shakespeare Company, you might recognize him from his performances in Netflix's Dracula, Criminal UK, Cursed, Night Flyers, of course, he stars in Home, which just finished its second season. But more than any of that, the most important thing I had to talk to him about was the fact that this man had a guest appearance in my favorite TV show of all time. I'm absolutely delighted to welcome to the We Do Hard Things podcast, Yusuf Kirkor. I was really, really excited when Bo told me that we'd have a chance to speak, simply for the reason that, you know, during this, uh, this time, let's call it, uh, I just worked my way through Criminal UK uh, a few months ago, and I was like, oh, it's that guy. And uh, you, you had a guest appearance in my favorite TV show ever. And, yeah. uh, and you know, being able to dig into, we, you know, we, I live in Canada, we don't have access to Channel 4, but being able to dig into some of what you've done with Home mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, your, your recent nomination and everything that you're doing, it's just like, oh, man, it's like, Thanks, dude. You're you're at a you're at a point where it seems like everything's clicking together, and I'm like I'm so excited to talk to you. And then I start to go through your IMDb, and I start to see your history, and I start to see your years, and I start to see oh, you know, like there's a two or three year gap between these two lines, and oh, um, you know, there's a lot of like just like year after year, decade after decade of um, you know smaller parts working your way up to other parts. So I'm talking to you where where you're here now. And maybe you want to be there, but you're here now. But there's so many decades of you just grinding Absolutely. away, man. Yeah, there's um, it, the, the, the analogy of the iceberg and the tip of the iceberg has become quite popular now. But I've had that in my in my sort of waters for a couple of decades. I've been I've been in the business 20 years now. I recently got a. About, I got a BAFTA nomination, uh, which was very, very blessed, very fortunate. To How get. does that feel? Sorry, uh, sorry. So, feels, so for anyone who doesn't know, BAFTA is like basically the uh, the Emmys or the Academy, Academy Awards, Awards yeah. of the UK, right? It's it's a yeah. big deal. It's a big deal. There's the film version. There's a TV version. Uh, I got nominated as, for best performer in a comedy for my work on Home, um, and it feels it feels. A very good question you know it feels wonderful to be picked do you know what i mean um it be to, 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 to have the industry that you work in go yeah you <laughs> you're we're gonna nominate you for for out of everybody i mean there are there are power hitters in, in not only my category but in my, in my field but in my category as well and uh, and none of them got nominated. So you get this ego boost. But the truth is, uh, I never aimed for the nominee. I don't. I don't live my life aiming for these accolades. Hmm. And so when they come, uh, when the nomination came, like all amazing things that come my way, I give myself a moment to understand it uh, rationally to observe it from as far away as I possibly can. And it's really, really hard to do that when it's good news and when your ego is getting massaged. But I like to just go as far above the whole thing and observe it from far away. The reason I do that is so that when things go really bad, I instinctively do that as well and, and guilt-free. Okay. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. Uh, just, uh, just, um,
really, really hits the fan and it can do, or if, or if I feel, if, if I feel like it's my fault or whatever, I instinctively have this thing of going way above it going, do you know what? It's just another one of the, whatever the self-talk is. Mm. Uh, and when things go really, really well, the same thing happens. It's like, look, this isn't what you're about. It's come your way. It's good. But there are a lot of things other than you that have conspired to bring this to you. So it's lovely, but this is not what we're about. And then we keep going. And um, I go back to your first point, which is the, you know, the two decades um, that I have underneath under my belt. Um, I have all sort of um, – have been full of this type of, this is how I, you're able to go, you know, 20 years working. And for the last, uh, let's say 11 or so years, uh, I haven't, I haven't done anything other than acting, which is, the, which is, which was always my goal. Um, right. And, 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 uh, that, and that's, and that's the thing, because actually you've just touched on something that I find very, very interesting. Mm. And that is, you know, so if you, how old are you, if you mind me asking? 42. 42. So from yeah. 22 to 42, you decide, you know, that you're going to be an actor. You spent uh, 11 years full-time acting, which means you spent nine years doing other stuff as well. Here's the question I have for you. So, so I went to film school awesome. and I was speaking to someone earlier today who went uh, to, to university to become a journalist. And, you know, I went to film school she went to journalism school and it was funny because we were both sharing this exact same moment. When we're growing up, we want to be something. We want to be someone. Mm. We want to do something extraordinary and remarkable. And mm. so you go off to uni, you go off to school, you go off to training and then you get there and they take your money and you learn and learn. And at a certain point you realize, Oh, very few of us are going to make it. Yeah. And even those of us who choose to make it, very few of those will actually make it. Yeah. And then even of those, some people have to get lucky. And so a lot of us, myself included, went, I'm not, I'm not, I'm, I'm not going to be the, the one selected. And so, uh, and so we go find other paths because we're just like, well, mm. there's only going to be three people at the top. Surely it's not going to be me. Mm. What I'm curious about when I looked at, again, your, your history and how long you were acting and stuff, did you, did you, first of all, did you have that type of moment and how you overcame it? Or how is it that you pushed through and decided that you were going to keep doing this thing when so many of us go, well, I'm not going to be at the one at the top. So what's the point? Yeah. Again, great, great question. I absolutely did. Um, what I, what I always try and remind people is you don't, you know, I trained, I died four years of university, a theater degree, university plus training at a drama school in England, you don't train to be um, a minor supporting role actor. Right. You, tra you train to play Romeo. You don't go to drama school thinking to yourself, one day, one day, I too can play second sergeant. You know what I mean? From the left mm -hmm. uh, in the background. Yeah. You train to play the leads. Yeah. Right. Hamlet, Romeo, Macbeth. And so it doesn't. And, and the reality of our industry being what it is, there's no way everybody can play those leads just physically, just um, superficially alone, aesthetically. Mm. Um, there's all these other considerations, which um, as a as a uh, as a fundamental of training people the idea is that it's best to make everybody believe they can to get everybody to aim for the top. Mm. It's better to do that than sort of say, you'll never make it. You're going to need to train it. That's not, that's not an effective way of training people. And so you train to be the, to get to the very top. And the one thing I had over everybody else, <laughs> I think is I realized very quickly that there that I was different. I was, I was tall. I was mm. a big dude. I, I got a head start in realizing actually I, I'm not, I don't actually look like everybody else. Mm. And when I was at college, I played the leads all the time and I graduated college and I had nowhere to live. And there I am sleeping on park benches and, and just working all the time, never stopped acting, worked all yeah, but, the time. But, but hold on right, right there. You just yeah. captured perfectly that, you know, you graduate 
and and you so so you realize okay so oh, i'm a little bit different there's something to this you yeah. played relead so obviously you're you're good um but you're sleeping on park benches you're yeah. <laughs> like yeah, yeah, yeah like yeah. most people yeah would and i don't think they should which no. is why i really want to crack yeah, to the yeah, like yeah. what what were you thinking? Yeah. So basically my, my goals were different from everybody else. And that was genuine. It, I genuinely did not want to be in magazines, have loads of money, uh, have loads of awards, have nominations, uh, be a star, uh, which, which I was, I was surrounded by all that ambition everywhere, but I didn't, that's not what I wanted mm. for me. Success was not being able to worry, not having to worry about whether I was going to work, not, not worrying about getting the next job mm -hmm. and not having to do any other work other than acting other than my passion, right. Yeah. To just do, do a job that I loved and get paid for it. And only that was bringing in the money and for the money to be good enough that I would be comfortable and to just carry on. Now that, that is, is, really 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 hard to get yeah it sounds really it sounds hard. easy yeah. right because because you know they talk about the difference between a hobby and a business right a hobby is something you yeah. love to do but no one will pay for business <laughs> is something you love to do hopefully yeah. uh, that people are willing to pay for yeah um and and yeah i mean like if yeah. you look at your career in acting it literally moves from like hobby Oh yeah. Yeah. To like Absolutely. a little breakthrough and just suddenly Absolutely. like, you're like, Oh, I, I'm, I'm a brand. I'm a I mean, look, I had, I had the passion, the passion was there and the passion was, the passion was, um, painful. Uh, you know, I, 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 you know, people say, you know, find your passion and do it. But then some of some other people adjust that and go, no, you need to find your burning passion. You need to find that thing that stops you being able to sleep properly at night. And it might not be the job you're doing. There might be that thing that just that, that uh, undefinable uh, feeling that you want and it just makes your heart go fast. And, you can, and that's, that's what it was like with me. And I, I, couldn't, I couldn't sit in, in the audience in the theater. I couldn't go watch the theater because it, it, it felt wrong. You know what I mean? It was like I right. need to be up there and not yeah. down. I cannot be sitting here. So it's such a strong vision of, of who you That's who be. I was. Exactly. That, exactly. That it bothered you that you're watching. You're like, mm. yeah, yeah. no, I really struggle. I really struggled with it. Sometimes I, and I had no clue how to get started. I just, I had you know, they didn't, they didn't back in my day, um, they didn't train you for that. They didn't, exp they didn't give you the nitty gritty about how to get ahead yeah it was just like this is how this is acting technique you, they trained you loads of different techniques loads of different things and then off you go and there i am in the city in new york city trying to wanting it and just i have no clue how to do it and i would i'd get these panic attacks and i would just just want it so badly um there's a whole load of stuff involved within that like why do you want it so bad like what where that comes from but um if you've just been acting your whole life and that's what you want um that the passion was there. and i think i think there's a reason why people always point to passion as being the primary ingredient because it was the fuel in those early days that really kept me going and and coupled with a realistic a realistic goal like it's hard to only make your money from acting, but it's not impossible. Mm. It is a lottery. It's buying a lottery ticket to say, I want to be, I want to have my, my name on the Hollywood walk of fame and, and, and win an Oscar and be a star, be a mega star. Mm. Um, that's like that. You just, you're buying a lottery ticket because when you see the, do, do you think it is or like, and the only reason I ask that is yes, it is. But then there's marketability. There's uh, you know, I, I mean, uh, look, pick someone, Bradley Cooper, sure. pretty charming guy, looks good, capable of acting, smart with business, has good people around him. Uh, you know, I, I'm not saying that you're, that you're not a charming guy or whatever, but, but, but you talked about your height. You, you, you've played mm -hmm. almost typecast roles in my opinion. Like people yeah. have seen, Oh, you're the guy who, who we're going to go ahead and, and make, um, you know, uh, Middle Eastern, or you're yeah. the guy that we're going to go ahead and make this way. And we're going to have you yeah. because you're so tall, we're going to use your presence to be dominating and all these things. So, yeah. so you're like a tool that, that creative people are using and implementing. But I think, I think well, the reason I say lottery ticket is because the, the elements of our industry, 
that people aren't aware of make it feel almost impossible for anybody who who if anybody who does not ha- tick those boxes hmm. like bradley cooper ticks a lot of the right boxes <laughs> and then he eyes, goes and i love those blue yeah, eyes <laughs> yeah and exactly right um but then he goes into he goes into a bag with another hundred thousand people who are just as charming just as beautiful whose eyes are just as blue uh, what what is it about his about him that makes it to the top? That's what I mean. It's it's stacked. It, it, it's really stacked heavily in the house's favor, right? We are commodities, and uh, you want to get to those dizzying heights. Well, then you got to be somebody that can that can sell movies, that can bring in an audience, that can X Y Z. You know, all these, the list goes on. And um, when you when you when you're wanting to do this for a job you are surrounded by everyone wanting that, you know? And so if you say to yourself, all right, let's just accept, I'm never going to walk a red carpet. I'm never going to be in a magazine. I don't want to be poor. I want to earn lots of money, but I, my goal is to just do this and to be able to do this. And uh, when, when you think that way, you don't aim for number one, you aim for number three. And that's, that's been the cornerstone, I would say, of my, of my really professional career mm. is not trying to aim for the top spot. I'm happy to aim for two or three rungs below it because number one alternates all the time. There's always a new number one, but number three can kind of pretty much stay there most of their career uh, that's how i've all that's how I saw it you know and you read those you know is it twenty seven in in immutable laws of marketing or immutable laws of marketing. Um, I, don't I, marketing the term. I should, I should know this, but I don't. Actually. <laughs> um, but that's one of the laws of marketing is that, you know, number, number, number two or number three will always be there. Number one, you know, uh, there's always another number one on, on, on the way. And you see that in the sort of churning out of work. But like for me, you know, a, 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 a good goal for me was, um, earning, you know, if you say, I want to earn an average of 70,000 a year mm-hmm. in, in, in an industry where people are earning 8,000, 10,000, like that's a pretty big goal, but it's doable. Mm-hmm. It's doable. You, your hard work can get you there. Mm-hmm. It's just a matter of adjusting your focus, adjusting what you're aiming for. And that's kind of, that's, that's how I just sort of, it's, it's the long road, but those are, those are the building blocks that you see behind me that you've quite rightly pointed out. There's a lot, you know, there's a lot of gaps between some of those years, you know, yeah. where I wasn't doing screen work on M that would get, make it to IMDb. I was doing theater work and it was mostly unpaid and nobody saw it. And, uh, what, and I was doing, you know, you build it, you, sometimes you do a, a job that lasts three months that nobody's going to see that you don't get paid in. You only do it because uh, the director is somebody that you, you want to be, you want to get closer to, you know, okay. and so, so on and so forth. You, you touched on something earlier, which is actually a question that I, I don't usually pre-plan questions, but this was something when I was re-looking at your, your recent work that I, that I was aware of. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was watching some stuff back. I realized that there must've been a time where the very thing that there must've been a time in my mind, this is what I'm thinking that where the very thing that would have upset you about, you know, your height, um, uh, maybe, maybe your, your ethnicity, your skin color, your background, whatever it might be, um, where you're just like, I wish that I had what these people had. And then it's like, Oh, and and you talked about this with your height, but there must've been a, a bigger moment where it was like, Oh, yeah, that's the that's the very thing that I can lean dude, into. Dude, such a good question. I mean, dude, you're really astute with your, with your questions, man. I, mean, <laughs> well, I can you. tell what you know. Bo's right, man. Like, we have our mutual friend Bo Hawkins. Um, now, now you're just flattering um, me. Thank you. Yeah, I know. He's uh, he he called this man. He was like, the guy's smart. But dude, that, that is exactly what happened. Um, that's uh, it's. I, I help a lot of young actors. I get a lot of people, and I always tell them this story about um, a couple a couple things. Um, one has to do with the idea of beauty. And I don't care what industry you're in. Beauty and aesthetics are a big factor. It's not fair. It shouldn't be the case, but it's there. In my industry, it's 100% in the DNA and the fabric of it. 
Uh, so when they say, you know, you get 10 seconds to make a first impression. Well, in, in our game, those 10 seconds decide whether you actually get the job or not. That first impression is the deciding factor. Mm -hmm. You either get a no nine times out of 10 or eight times out of 10, maybe, or you get a, oh, okay, maybe. And that, oh, okay, maybe is usually an aesthetic thing that carries you over the threshold. Now, it doesn't mean you need to be super beautiful to get all the parts. Sometimes you could be not that. The aesthetics change and they shift. And as a performer, if you can divorce yourself from the need to be, to fit a sort of uh, uh, ideal idea of beauty, mm. um, then you actually stand a better chance of working. So I used to, for years, never smile. I don't, my, my teeth aren't straight. I don't have straight white, pearly whites like you mm. see in, uh, in Hollywood. Um, they're jagged, they're discolored, they're fangy. I got big gums. I show a lot of gum when I smile. So I never smiled in any of my headshots because that was a weak point for me. It was mm. not aesthetically beautiful. I'm also I'm bald. I would do everything to try and cover. Yeah, hey, it's, 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 it's the solar panel. There right? we it's go, we get man. Our energy. Yeah, yeah, I heard you say that in the interview, the solar panel. <laughs> yeah, it's the solar panel. Um, but yeah, I am... Um, so I would never smile. And then one day a, a switch just went in my head. I'm like, I, 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 and it's because I was, you know, I was struggling to get a lot of screen work and stuff. And I'm thinking, what am I doing? Why am I trying to pretend I am something? I'm, my, my teeth aren't straight. The joy of any marketplace, any marketplace, is that there is a customer for what you're selling somewhere. Mm. <laughs> They're out there. You've just got to find them. And if you're in an industry or any industry where you're advertising who you are and saying, are you interested? Well, then just show who you are all the way without judgment because there is a market for it out there. And so I did, I, then I had a headshot where I did the biggest, gummiest smile with us. And all of a sudden, what happens I start getting these roles for homeless people, uh, drug addicts, um, bad, bad guy. They didn't, they didn't, I Dude. mean, you want work, your goal paychecks is to get paid, a paycheck. But you know, you see these two actors meet each other going, Hey, you working? Yeah, I'm working. You working? Yeah, I'm working. What are you doing? Oh man, I'm playing this rapist and blah, 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 blah. Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> Dude, what are you playing? Oh, I'm playing this terrorist and blah, 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 blah. That's awesome. It doesn't matter, man. This is our job, <laughs> you know? Um, uh, that without judgment, you don't judge the stuff you get. The idea is to work, right? Yeah. To work and get paid, pay, get paid well. To do, you get think people, up. do you think people, because they're striving for perfection and because they want the perfect resume and because they're above it and all of these things, do you think too many people in your field or any other field um, want the, sh the number one you talked about, right? They want the shiniest thing that yeah. everyone's going after to the yeah. point of ignoring the, the yeah. leg work, the grunting, the grind, the time, the hustle and everything else. I think everybody, everybody's willing to hustle. Everybody's willing to work hard. Mm -hmm. Everybody's willing to prove to you if you give them the chance that they can make it worth your while. Everybody's talented. Everybody's beautiful in their own way. Everybody's got the same thing. But what's happening is everybody's goals more often than not are the same. When they close their eyes and they see where they would like to be career-wise, it all points to the same top of the top of the food chain, right. shiny star. Right. And nobody's thinking, um, you know, I'm trying to find a specific example. This uh, this happens in this happens in in business all the time. It's so yeah, funny. all the time. You, dude. you meet the, someone, you meet yeah. someone with generational wealth, like multi generational wealth, yeah. and, and you're like, oh yeah, where does the family wealth come from? They're like, scrap metal, yeah. and you're like, you're like, what? <laughs> scrap metal? Yeah. What are you talking about? Like, yeah. you know? And they're like, yeah, yeah, we just we run a really big metal business. Metal, exactly. And they're, like, they're like, okay, or you know, I met someone a few years ago who runs a cor a corrugated box company you know like somebody needs to make boxes someone needs exactly. to make corrugated boxes i don't know why you picked that or got into it exactly. I, I wouldn't i wouldn't think to start a corrugated box company no we're like one of the richest people in the world is tetra pack i like it like you know the 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 yeah. that box that you make that, that the orange juice comes in you know exactly. that stuff is like you know the build who cares what the building block is um mm. but my point but 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 the the 
going back to your to your question, yeah, um, I think people aim for the same thing, and people don't adjust their goals. And like, so the riches are in the niches, right? <laughs> the, or the niches, as as Pat Flynn says. <laughs> so, niche. Um, I, I'm Canadian, so we say niche. <laughs> absolutely, we say niche. It is niche. It just apparently it, it rhymes better with the but. But um, if you focus on, I mean, I say focus on number three and not number one. That's a nice way of saying that the top spot that gets all the glory. Mm. Yes, it is profitable, but um, uh, you know, ten years ago I was making seventy thousand a year, eighty thousand a year, and uh, nobody knew who I was. In an in, in an industry where ninety percent of my peers were making eight, nine, twelve max, um, and so that's what I'm talking about. And the reason I had that is because I didn't want any of the accolades or any of the big stuff. And I was happy to not be in all six episodes of a series. I was happy to be in two, epi- two, epi- two you know, four scenes across two episodes. But then I would do that for three or four series, you know, and build. Mm-hmm. And what I'm learning now is that time... <laughs> Time is the coefficient that, ev- that that solves everything. It's the magic fairy. If I said to you, I've got this fairy dust that I can sprinkle on your life and you will get anything you want. Like, would you do it? Time is that thing. And the challenge becomes, can you outlast the pain <laughs> if it's not coming your way? Uh, you, want to, you started a business, you're struggling. Yeah. All you need is time because you're going to get there eventually. Yeah. If you if you are putting one foot in front of the other, if you are applying everything you need, if you're coming at it from every angle, if your passion is there, if you're monitoring yourself and keeping yourself in check and then trying to grow, there is you can go to the moon if you want to go to the moon. All I need is your desire and time, and I will send you to the moon. Hmm. Anything is possible, but you need time. So, so which, can, which you talk to these students and which do people give up on? Do they give up on the belief or do they get impatient? They, they, um, I, I think those two options are the same. Mm. I think there's a bit of that that happens. They get impatient. The, the, the impatience is there to begin with. Um, I'm, I'm constantly trying to say you have a plan in mind for how, for where you want to be at a certain time. Uh, you need to double that time and you need to go a few rungs down. Mm-hmm. Um, by all means, you might get there quicker and you might get further, but you need to adjust your expectations, especially in an industry that is oversaturated, where the competition is stupid. I mean, stupid, ridiculous. Um, where a, you are literally defined as, a, as insane by attempting it because of the debt by the definition of insanity. Right. Um, and so, uh, so everybody's impatient to start with, but I think the main thing is the bills are expensive, man. You know, bills are expensive, bills are expensive and the bills don't stop just cause you're broke. And, uh, it's, that's, you know, I tend to, I tend to try and see things in as, in, in, in the sort of cold, hard cash version of things. And that's kind of, that's kind of what, what gets in the way, man, you know, um, people cannot afford to carry on. It has to be a hobby because, um, because the, the, the life takes on other things. And, 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 you know, for me, the other thing I say to everybody is everything is linked to everything, but yeah, that's kind of, that's kind of how I've, um, that's, that's my contention is that everything is attached to everything else. Mm. You can, you can, you can you can make a hurricane happen on the other side of the world with a butterfly flapping its wings. You just need to know what all the links are in the chain and be able to affect it, and then you will make that happen. But 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 understanding that means uh, okay. I want to work as an actor, feel comfortable, feel free, and be able to do it uh, without any resistance. What are the things that conspire to allow that to happen? Um, so, you know, you might not be a voice actor at all. What you want to do is be in movies, but if you get yourself a voice agent and have a voice career that pays the bills, 
what ends up happening in 10 years is you, you have a, the f- film career that you've always wanted. Right. You see, because you're doing so, the work now, which helps you pay the bills, which means you're not worrying about correct. it, which means you have a clear mind space, correct. and which means you can dedicate yourself more to the craft and make more networks and make more connections. That's right. And exactly. You and go. you can say no properly because mm. you get known for what you say no to as much as for what you say yes to. Tell me more about that. I've, I've actually so, never heard that within this industry. Yeah. So um, there are many different facets of it. A very simple one, salary, right? How much money you 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 are earn in America in the in, in the U.S. North America it's even more cutthroat here here in England we don't really have this thing but if you do a job like my friend did where you get paid two hundred thousand dollars okay for the gig you get a massive a massive <laughs> yeah, he got a massive leading role in the series it was a huge big break and that was he got about two hundred thousand dollars two hundred thousand dollars for the whole series. Two hundred thousand dollars for the whole it's, series. Not not very many episodes, just a yeah. little bit. But that's yeah. his big. That's a that's a you know that's a big chunk of change. Um, and with with all these options, and he would have gotten made millions had it gone to another series and all that stuff. But then he got another gig that was offering him fifty thousand dollars for about a week's work, maybe two weeks work. But something about how the money broke down meant that he had to say no to the job. He had to turn it down because the money was less than the previous job that he got. Mm-hmm. And you can never, you must not do that. Oh, in England, we don't, we don't give a shit about that. Right? <laughs> you just, <laughs> but money it, floats a little bit. But, but you can, by saying no, yeah. lay down what your financials are for the industry. People start to know, okay, this person got offered this amount of money and he said, no, that means we can't offer him any less than this amount. So you establish uh, so your baseline. Negotiating you see, yeah, you're sending messages out to the industry by what you're saying no to also. But then you're also by standing those guns, you're also, if let's say that, you know, Hey, I've got a, a week, a week's project. We only have 35,000 for it. I know his baseline's 50, no point in offering. Uh, correct. I mean, look, I don't think I, I'm not, it's not my school of thought. <laughs> I mean, for me, I take I take as much as I can. Um, you know, the luxury of choice is really a luxury. If you're, you know, if you're in business and you're needing as much cust- as many customers as you can get, you know, you want to be able to apply the eighty twenty principle to your business. You want to be able to do that, but it's hard to do when you've only got three clients, right? You know what I mean, or something. So, you know. Um, uh, what, how do you grow those clients by turning clients away? <laughs> there is a, a, a reality in which that can happen. Mm. I want more, I want better parts that mm. pay better. Mm-hmm. And so for six months, I'm going to have to play chicken with the industry and start right. saying no to these tiny, thankless parts that pay nothing or these leading roles where the pay is, is ridiculously insulting. Yeah. And, you know what I mean? And, um, you know, that's, that's, um, that's what I mean by growing, by saying no. So, and, and what you, you know, how, that you become known for what you say no to, because you establish, this is an industry which is so big and any industry that is as vast as this one with as many different varying levels of players and all the competition there is. I mean, the challenge becomes establishing your identity in all this noise. Mm. Who, who are you? Because mm. let me tell you, if people know who you are, they I'm like really know who you are and what you're about, your market starts to open up and starts to appear. Mm. And people start, people start flocking to you and you start being able to sell properly. Likewise, as a performer, if you, if you have a very clear idea of who you're performing to, and I'm talking one face that represents why you're doing what you're doing. Yeah, there, exactly. it, there it is. There he is right there. That guy. <laughs> you know. But if you focus on that properly, then your work improves. You 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 tap into that thing that people want to see. Mm. Specificity of audience, right? But you need to know who you are. You need to know what you're doing. So. That we're coming into the the thing where everybody says, you know, how do you book an audition? Because there's there's so many layers to to to, to the, the entertainment industry, the acting game. You know, um, you might you might your job is not 
performing in front of the camera or on stage. Your job is auditioning. That's your I've, job. I've, your I've job heard is, that. I've you know heard I mean? that yeah. so much, it's, right? Your full-time job is auditioning. The bonus is if you book the part. Uh, absolutely, yeah. Booking is is great. And once you book it, that you shouldn't actually be, it should be a no-brainer as to what you're doing. But the hard bit is how to how to book that gig, you know, and um, experience. So, so can I ask you, you so if, if we break up your period, you know, obviously, I mean, you have yeah. a whole life before you were 22, of even course, you decide yeah. to be an actor. You have a nine-year period. You have an 11-year period. The last bunch of years have, has really started to get, you yeah. know, opened up a lot of new opportunities for you. At what point did you start to feel, or at what points did you start to feel like a success? Yeah, so... That's um, yeah, that's a really, yeah, good question. I think <laughs> you don't have no, to say no, that every time, man. No, no, but it is, but it is. It's a, it's a great, it's a great point because in many ways, I've all, I, I, I'm so afraid of of that def of trying to define any experience as that because I'm, I worry that then uh, I don't know how to carry on, how to really? carry on from that. Why? You, know, you want to well, like, yeah, what? you just think oh, I don't want to. I just want to feel like everything I do is just the next step up. Okay. And just carries on and let's not try and um i don't so want was to there, say i guess that. let me say this aside from the ability to say i'm now a full-time actor yeah obviously moving from you know gig gig work and whatever and and and, and free stuff to being like i am a full-time actor i mean yeah. that is accomplishment there's respect there yeah. uh, you know it's something and and that probably is a good turning point but mm. was there something else that happened a booking a show you got you got the script in front of you you're flipping through it and you're like this this is the thing. This is the thing. Or is everything yeah. that you do the thing? That's the thing, man. It's, it's, uh, the truth is uh, that what, what, what you're sensing is uh, I don't feel like, it's, like I've, okay. I've made it or am now successful uh, in my field. Um, I, I don't feel that way. Um, I, I can objectively look at it and think, okay, the, I'm now getting a few more offers coming my way. Um, but it's, I still... You know, I'm risk averse. I always look for the, I always feel the uphill. And so I'm always feeling the resistance to where I'm going. But then again, if I'm honest with you, my, my, I try and adjust what I want as quickly as possible, as early as possible. Oh, that's so there's, interesting. there's usually always a tension, a tension. Yeah. Uh, do you know what I mean? So by the time you get to a place where you think people will be like, man, I made it. But actually, I, I, long before that, I'm like, no. So now this is what I want. <laughs> so okay. by the time I get there, it's kind of just like, okay, well, I'm still. What's next? What's, what's next? next? What's I'm still next? On, on the on road. Yeah, it's a growth, definitely a growth mentality. Do you know what I mean? Like, uh, uh, yeah. I mean, what something that ha you know what what happened was realizing that getting a better idea of what people see when I walk in the room. Um, so it's so is, funny because because yeah. I, I've I, I went to film school and then I own a, I'm own a marketing agency and we awesome. this you know we built a video agency so I've done lots and lots of casting I've never been on your side uh, you know we do commercial work and yeah. we don't do narrative work but um, it's so funny because the thing I try not to say aloud ever and the thing I try not to think or let bias my decision when I'm casting someone is I didn't picture them that way yeah because. You know, you, you know, you're you're writing, you're creating characters. You you have this image in your head of of the way they'll speak or the way the the beats will be. You yeah. know, Aaron Sorkin is classic for like making sure everybody says exactly what's yeah. in the script. Yeah. But but then people would come in and just you know performance performance trump in my opinion performance trumps looks all the time. Yeah. You know, uh, but people would come in. I go, wow, I just love them, but I didn't think of them that way. You know, <laughs> and and so just. If I were in your shoes, if I was on the other side, that would just drive me crazy all the yeah, time. Yeah, it's nuts because because it changes depending on the person you're meeting, right? Um, you and you can't I mean? get in front of it. No, you could. You're looking to look exactly the same from three different meetings, and a, a, three different people will say three different things about how they how they took you in. And in many ways, a lot of what you're trying to do is control that as mm. much as possible. You're trying to really control how people see you, but because you don't want to box yourself in too much, you are trying to keep it kind of open. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, that's where people go. That's where people go wrong. People don't take the risk and being like, do you know what? I am a six foot five bearded, balding Arab with bad teeth. There are, there are, there is a much smaller 
range of roles on the rainbow of roles that I, that I can be playing. And I'm going to aim for those Mm -hmm. and nail those. And if uh, every single audition I walk into, I'm going to walk into going, hi, this is who I am. I'm playing these, these things is what I'm here to do. And if, and you got to take the risk, they're going to go, no, 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 I didn't want that. Which let me tell you never happens. Right. Never. What happens is they go, ah, boo, yeah, 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 he's that guy. Okay, cool. Well, okay, could do a. He's that guy. He's providing this image. This sort of thing is what he's doing. Okay, is this? Is there is there room for that? And what I want because then you get then you get right. the confidence to be able to say, listen, I know I'm here to audition for this bit, but actually, I think I'm better playing over this here. bit over yeah. here. And it doesn't matter how big that, but it could be the lead. I don't care if I'm right for it. And I know that I can do it in my sleep. I have no qualms about saying I'm actually going to audition for that because that's who I am. That's that this is, that's the merchandise that is in front of you right now. That's the commodity yeah. that's in front of you. It's that. Yeah. And I find that as, as a, as a, you know, my, my experience with people out there buying what I'm selling is they really, really want that. They want that approach. They want people to say, yes, there's a whole range of things that we could be doing, but we are these people. Oh, so, so you know I mean? if, if, I'm, if I'm hearing you right, it's having the confidence. Okay, so the way that I see this is I would fear if I was coming in and auditioning that if you don't like what I'm doing, you don't like me. But as an actor, you're, you're, you're putting on a part, you're putting on a role, and actually what you're just giving them is your interpretation or take on how it could be. And so if they don't like it, yeah, whatever, it's an inter- it's a pitch. Yeah. It's a oh, pitch, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's an interpretation. Yeah, that's, it's, like, that's, it's like it could yeah, be this. Exactly. I'm, not, I'm not saying this is me. Exactly. And I think, I think it's getting rid of the idea that it's like if I, if, if I gave you a script, right, mm-hmm. and you read the part, now, now I need you to come in and okay. basically ready. prove to me. I mean, <laughs> you don't have to do it now. I did. I did. Uh, I did grade nine drama. <laughs> exactly. I'm ready. <laughs> <laughs> but if I said to you, man, you, and effectively have to prove to me that you are worthy of the part. That's basically what it is. Prove mm-hmm. to me that you're right for the part. Mm-hmm. You will find that your brain starts to provide you with 20 different ways you could play this part. It all the, what am I looking for is what you're going to be saying to yourself. Just, just what do they want? And you hear that. I hear this from young people a lot. How can I know what they want before I come into the room? And you can. Cause if I know what they want, I'll give it to them. Right. You see? And that's the, that's the, that's the obstacle in many people's minds when they go audition or interview or whatever you want to, whatever it's trying to f- as quickly and efficiently as possible, figure out what it is the person on the other side of the table is looking for and to make all the necessary internal and external adjustments to yourself to be able to provide that for the person. So you deliver on a silver platter what's in their mind. When actually what you should be doing is going, I don't care what they're looking for. This is all I can do. Mm. What I can do so many things, but what I do best is this guy with this energy, with these inflections and this things. And if I play teachers, they tend to be in this way. Like you get as specific and as niche as possible. And if I get an audition going, um, this guy is a, um, you know, he's a hairdresser. He's got blah, 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 blah. And I just say, no, I can't, I can't I'm not going to go up. I can't audition for that because that's not who I am. I'm a hmm. big, big bearded Arabic balding dude. Okay terrorists but homeless dude, people but dude man you play you know like, like just the campest hairdresser in the world and think about <laughs> the juxtaposition it's so absolutely good. it's absolutely but this is what happens man when you start out yeah. that is true that because that is true that is the truth right now of course i'd audition for that because i've got a body of work behind me that can back it up but when i was just starting out those are the parts that i was waiting for like come on man give me the give me the camp hairdresser give me the the the, the neighbor uh the the uncle the friendly uncle the friend like it's cool man look dude i'm so big it's juxtaposed it's, the, the juxtaposition is interesting and what i came up against was the cold hard brutal fact of reality of our industry which is no i we want you to be a commodity what is the box that you fit in? 
Mm. We need to see that box. And if it's wishy-washy in your brain, then you're just going to be floating around with everybody else trying to convince the industry that you can do anything because mm. you've trained for it, you're prepared for it, you have a natural ability, whatever. You know, I can do it. Just give me the chance and I'll do it. Yeah. It doesn't this work is, that way, man. This you, is such a beginner's uh, challenge for anything, for it's anything, for business, hard, yeah. for marketing, for sales, for whatever it is, for performance, um, for art. It's it's the like, yeah, it's the, if you just tell me what you want, I can do it for you because I have all of this great training and I have a lot of hustle and a lot of heart. No one's going to take a risk on that. No, no one's going to, no. no one's going to invest money and time yeah. on, on the like, trust yeah. me, yeah. I've got this. And it's, it's such like, a big thing that, because if I said to you, okay, you want a job, right? You want to work for a, a company doing what you love. Great. What if I told you, you had to, you had to go through 19 interviews where you were told no in order to get that one job, you know, of course you do it in retrospect. But if I say to you, do you want a job? Do you want a job in three months time? Yes, I do. Okay, great. And then that's, that's an easy, that's an easy hypothetical. That's an easy yeah. thing to aim for. But if I, but if I said to you, you're going to have to start going to, to interviews and every time you go interview, you're getting no, 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 no. In three months you get a yes. And that's, and then you start working there. So focus on where you'd like to be hmm. and backtrack from there this is a this is a, something that i've done o- over the years and there, there might be a name for it and this might be a, a thing that everybody does for all i know <laughs> but um in the same way that uh you know i don't regardless of what people's opinions of law of attraction and all that stuff i think there's something to it i haven't really explored it very much but something i understand about visualizing and and, and setting goals for yourself is they got to be realistic mm-hmm. they can't be too far away they got to be kind of around the corner goals, possibly around the corner goals. Mm-hmm. And because everything, <laughs> but every, if you just aim for a goal, that's literally just around the corner, it's, it can springboard onto the next one, the next one, the next mm-hmm. one, the next one, until eventually you get to that really far away goal. But what I like to do is visualize something that I want. That's not too far away around two corners away and really feel myself in that place. Focus on, on my, on, on me in that place, having everything that I want without resistance and then look backwards Hmm. to today, to this moment and to see what are the obvious steps that would have had to happen in order to get there. Yes. And you don't even need to, that's not even necessarily an intellectual, rational thing. It's a, it's a visceral, emotional snapshot. Yes. I call it, who do you need to be? Who do you need to be? Oh man! And, so and I even great, I even went out and bought yeah. I even bought out uh, who you need to be dot com because I was just like Dude, there's something awesome. there's something to it. this. It's just you know who do I need to be to be the you know to be the type of person to get X to achieve Y to whatever it is. Who do you yeah. need to be? Who do you need to be? And and as a result, what would you have done? Mm-hmm. What, what actions what, would what you have taken? Yeah. Who would you hang out with? What actions would you take? What mindset would you have? Who do you need to hire what exactly, exactly. All Who do you that need stuff. to be. Who it's cracking. Be? And if you do, if you don't visualize too far away in the distance, if you just, if you, you know, if you want to be, you know, if you don't own a car, and and like having a car is one element of your big dream, but mm-hmm. just focus on owning a car, getting a car. Like it's if it's close by, it's so doable. Mm-hmm. It's so doable because you get that snapshot of information that just goes, all right, but bang, let's, yeah. let's, and you can put things into motion. I love that. Who do you need to be? It's really, yeah. uh, who I do you mean, need to be? What do you I need to be? I own a marketing about? agency. And so when we're, when it's, it's funny because mm-hmm. we've done this for years. I mean, a lot of times p- people come and I, I don't want to go on a rant here, but, but a lot of people who want to start something, go, go, this is what I am. This is who I am. I'm going to put out the world. You like me or hate me done. And that works if you don't mind who you attract and who you turn away. Yeah. But if you're actively trying to go, like I use this analogy, if I wanted to work with Kanye West, I'm not in a position to work with Kanye West, but I don't know how long it'll take five years, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. If that was really my goal, I would need to ask myself, who do I need to be? Who do I need to hang out with? Who do I need to talk to? What, what type of mindset do I have to have? Um, What kind of work do I have to do? What experience do I need? So that way I can work with Kanye West. And yeah. the same thing is true in marketing. The same thing true yeah. in sales. The same thing is true yeah. in, in anything that you want to go absolutely, after. Absolutely. Anything you want to go after. I mean, I mean, so, you know, an industry like the entertainment industry, a performer's life, you know, you're desperate 
for methods to achieve your goals. I mean, God, everybody's got this, these goals and, you know, like, okay, well, how do you do it? Well then, but they, but they work, they work. And sort of, um, what you, you know, this, this thing, and like I said, I guess, um, to use your example, who do I need to be? I, if you break it down even for like, you want to work at Kanye West. Okay. Brilliant. That's the, that's the end goal. How do you get to Kanye West? You can break it down and you'll find somebody quite close to you in your near your circle that you can actually get to. And that's step one of the ladder. And then on you go, bang, bang, yeah. bang, 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 till eventually it leads to Kanye West. Yeah. All you need is time. All you need is passion. That You know, you need to not tire yourself out. Yeah. And you need to not have life kick your ass too much that you have to stop. I love it. You see? Well, I, listen, I'd, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you about a, a few shows and, and Please, whatnot. Man, Are you yeah, comfortable yeah. sharing some stories? Please. I think, I think I, you know, I, and there's also, I don't even know if I answered your earlier question about what where the turning point was, but dude, deciding that I was the big bearded dude and, and playing <laughs> terrorist parts, playing terrorists for years is what grew my my career and my CV. I, you know what? I, I kind of guessed that because I was taking audio notes earlier. Um, and, and I was, and one of the notes I took was there must've been a time that, that you went from being like, damn it, like another, another <laughs> terrorist part. Like how many yeah. times can I be on MI5 <laughs> or whatever you know, it was? Spooks, I guess you guys call it over yeah. there. Uh, you know, uh, to, to like, Watch me, watch me walk into this room right. and watch me carry this entire performance or whatever yeah. it is. I just, yeah, yeah. I felt like there must have been some of that. But if I can ask, so I, I don't, I don't need to, I don't want to go back too far because I want to start with Gavin and Stacey. So okay. uh, I don't know if Bo warned you or not, but that's my favorite TV show of all time. Amazing. Uh, I've watched it many, many, many times. Um, and delight, I was so delighted. So here's what happened. I, I, I heard you were coming on the podcast. So I go to IMDb and I go, you're Gavin and Stacy. And I was like, I've watched, I've watched all of the episodes. Like I have them on DVD. I've watched all the episodes so many times. I'm like, what? And then I'm like 2019. I'm like, what, what happened in 2019? A Christmas special. I'm like, there's another episode. <laughs> what? And so like, I had to like run out and oh, like dude. watch it because I'm just like, Oh my goodness. I love, I love, how positive it is. I love how, how fairy tale it is. I, I love everything about that show. And so I'm watching it and I'm just like, where is he? Where is he? Where is he? And then, and then you play the neighbor down the street that that's right. Yeah. And all this stuff. And then, and then I was like, Oh, okay. That was, that, that, that was, it was only a 55 minute episode. That's right. They had to jam a lot of it in all that stuff. How, how did you get that part? So got an audition through Gavin and Stacey Christmas special. I went in there. It was to read for a different part. You know, there's a guy who's getting a tattoo and he's yes. talking. Yeah, yeah, yeah talking the guy who gets the tattoo on yeah, the back. Tattoo and on the back. Yeah. So that's the guy I went into audition for. Okay. And there's um, this uh, this old Welsh guy in the, in the green room waiting. And he's like, you, and he looks, he goes, you're here to audition for my part? And I went, no, 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 I'm auditioning for the younger, this, the dude getting the tattoo. And he went, oh, all right, yeah, yeah audition for the older neighbor and i went oh, okay great and i go in there and of course in the middle of the audition they go listen this part might not be right for you do you mind trying different this other thing anyway ruth jones was there who plays nessa yeah uh, and she's one she's of the writers co-creators absolutely and mm-hmm. phenomenal uh c- comedic mind and uh we just hit it off man we just had a great and she's the loveliest person the loveliest, nicest person, and very, very, very elegant and classy. So <laughs> and, opposite and to the role so she plays as, in the as show. Vanessa. She plays it, yeah, she's proper rough in yeah, Gavin yeah. and Stacey. And I was so like taken aback. I, I, it was like, wow, you know, you expect to see Nessa or just a flavor of it, and she's not. She's actually very refined and really, really, really elegant, really classy. And um, and I was so that was immediately I was like, oh man, okay, this this woman knows how to play a character, you know. Yeah. And um, and then I just did the scene, and I, and I just did, I, because I because they handed it to me on the spot, and and when she that just tends did a to happen, just a cold read. Yeah, I, I yeah. tend to want to do it cold and without preparation i'm okay sight reading i don't give a shit if i'm looking at the paper if somebody's just handed it to me um a lot of people worry about that they want you know they they ask for a little bit of time to read it so that they don't so they're not glued to the page but you give me something at a moment's notice you're gonna get what you're gonna get right um but uh 
but as it happened, it was it was relatively short scene, quite easy to memorize, just quickly on the spot, and and I did stuff, and and then my sh- my shout to my w- wife made yeah. me laugh, and 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 that's it, and they just um, it just it just went really really well, and, and so, I got so I got just quickly point. to explain the scene to any listener who may not have or viewer may not have seen it. So basically, it's Christmas Eve. Uh, the the main character who's very gruff and her little son come to your house and they sing Christmas carols, and then it's kind of revealed that they do this all the time that they're not going to leave until you pay them. They want whatever it is, two quid and you have no cash on you. And so they want you to pay with a visa instead. That's kind That's of the right. joke, right? That's right. That's right. Kind of the joke. They've, they've been carol singing. Uh, this is holding like the, you hostage the fifth night in a row that they've carol song and they're not going to leave until I, I pay them. That's, you know. um, but it was a lot of fun, man, you know, going to, and like what people don't see is that because they filmed it in Barry mm-hmm. in, in Wales and to the left and right of camera of where we were was about about 500 people just crowds of people just crowds because it's such a popular show over there hugely popular and this was like 10 years after the last episode right yeah and like then here's here's a good a good uh teachable moment in this uh i said yes to the show because it's gavin and stace is a huge show and um uh and the part is minuscule. And I've I'd come off of um, Home, my second season of Home, um, where I'm playing the lead man. I'm mm-hmm. on set all day long. I've you know I'm in, in 25 out of or 24 out of 25 days. Filming. Is it nice what, playing a day part, man? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And then you get this thing. It's like you can have like one or two lines and stuff. But it's a big show. Yeah. Um, from that, <laughs> from Gavin and Stacy. I got so much other stuff out of it. There was a, the National Television Awards, which is like a huge, huge award show here with like literally everybody in it. And I find myself in the front row with the Gavin and Stacey cast who are going to receive their sort of like, not the Lifetime Achievement Award, but the equivalent, you know, the, yeah. the, the National Television Spirit Award or whatever it's called. And um, Ruth Jones, who uh, by this point, we're, we're in a, you know, we communicate and, and, and uh, are very complimentary uh, to each other, uh, insists that I join them and be part of the cast there in the row. And, and it's just, and then there I am in front, you know, and of course I shaved my beard off for this other job. I was, was, and nobody knew who I was, right? You know, <laughs> which is fine. But um, I got exposed, I got more exposure as an actor in, in such a short amount of time from that one little bit. Um, and I couldn't have predicted that. I couldn't have told you that that's what would happen. Um, maybe could have predicted the stuff. And, and because of ev- the way everything was panning out, um, there was Dracula that I'd also done mm-hmm. that came out kind of at the same time. Um, and then there was two other jobs that I'd done on Channel 4. So all of a sudden, in, in a space of two weeks, You're I was everywhere. On You're everywhere. Everywhere. <laughs> everywhere. Right. You know, and everybody was like, man, what? You're everywhere. You're doing so much stuff. And actually, if you break them down, it was just home that was my leading part. The other ones were just appearances. Right. But it all of a sudden, looks it gives, it creates an impression that You're is everywhere. beyond the actual job that you've done. And I think yeah. that's that's you know that's tr- good traction. That's kind of what you want to be mm-hmm. aiming for. If 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 you have a company and somebody somebody is going to have a phone call with somebody from your company as to whether yes or no they buy it if they see your logo on a coffee cup in the trash on their walk to work and then they see some kid with the t your t-shirt of your company's logo walking the other way two hours later and then they hear a jingle on the radio and it, and it builds up they you stand a much better chance of getting their custom <laughs> when because you talk think to you're them. everywhere because they think you're everywhere and it doesn't yeah. matter if actually you've only paid for advertising in this one little town or this one little region. Or if you're paying the kid to wear the t-shirt on that street uh, correct, at that correct, time correct, and you're, is, and you're, and you, you're getting up at 5 a.m. to drop <laughs> cups of coffee. Absolutely. You know, on the way. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, I talk, you know, looking at things like Facebook marketing and all that stuff or Instagram marketing, where you pay for your work for something to be promoted. And I've always found it really interesting how, you could just focus everything on a really tiny, tiny, tiny sector or, or ge- geography, b- b- part of the world. Yep. 
It's and called, I think it's called niching down. Niching that's what, down. That's what the well, Americans call it. Niche, well, I love it, yeah, man, niche, because niche down, niche that's, in. dude, you just, but that's what that you've done. Like essentially the, <laughs> the questions I was asking and the reason why I, I think, you know, it's, it's very sweet for you to say that they're great questions, but um, it's because it's the same questions we ask all the time. It's, mm. it's what you did early on is you, you found an opportunity, you found a lane, you started to play to your skills. You started to really embrace who you are and, and you really, you really niche down. You just, you're just like, this is, this is who I am. This is what I'm yeah. going to do. And, um, and it seems like the only- goal with the goal yeah. of eventually, <laughs> with, with the goal of eventually breaking out of it. Right. I mean, I think that's a sort of, um, it's an unspoken, uh, truth about it all you do that yes. in order to, to, in order to eventually go, all I'm right, gonna do what I want to do. Yeah. I'm not, now I'm going to do what I'm going to do. You know who I am now. Mm-hmm. It's like also if you have the, I don't know, um, like within our, within my industry there are parallel in, there are parallel lanes. Mm-hmm. There's the film lane. There's the TV mm-hmm. lane. There's the theater lane. The the audio voice lane. Yep. The voice one being a much bigger commercials sort of, catalogs if they still exist. I don't know if they do or not. Exactly. But yeah, you know, yeah. All of those things. Yeah. Yeah. So all these different things, and so if you can split up your industry into different sections, you're able to sort of ladder move uh, laterally while rising. Mm. So I start to do television and because I start to do television, it doesn't matter if the parts are small because I'm doing television. Who's, who's uh, in using this analogy, whose lane is a little bit more high, has a bit more commands, a bit more respect and oomph than the theater lane. Mm-hmm. It doesn't matter that I'm playing small, thankless parts in this TV lane. Now I say, no, I'm not going to do this. Any theater parts that aren't leading roles Hmm. or, or, or at least uh, top three in the billing. And sure enough, I'll go yonks. I'll go ages, not playing, not doing any theater, but eventually it starts to come. And that's, Hmm. that's precisely what's happened. Now I only play leading roles in the theater and that's not something I could have done had I stayed in the theater lane, trying to grow my career to where I play leading roles. That's n- it was never going to happen. Mm. Um, so you're, I, you're hop, you're hop scopping around. Hop so that scopping way, left. You, you, you're going hop scopping. I meant hot, hop scotching. I, I said hop scotting <laughs> and you just repeated, repeated it. it. Yeah, yeah. But hop scotching <laughs> around and, and you have the freedom as you talked about, you have the freedom to say no to, to these things because you have, you have this that you're that's focusing right. on and then, and then eventually it comes back. And then it comes back and then it grows and grows and grows. And then, and then, and, and, and finding mm-hmm. uh, lateral uh, having it doing a lateral move to, to, to for income, mm-hmm. finding something laterally, really laterally uh, in my case, voiceover, a uh, voice work, um, you know, corporate voice stuff, uh, yeah. computer games, uh, ADR yeah. or whatever. And that's, and that pays the bills. It's not, it's it, half the time most of the time it's not credited nobody will know that i've done a lot of the voice work that i've done you know like i say you know 90 percent of the work i do is uncredited mm-hmm. um and so it's not for that it's purely a money thing but mm. because of it you can do the uh, things you want you can do the things you want to do uh you know i was filming in italy filming in rome last year and i saw the pandemic uh of coming from it's from, from from starting from a conspiracy theory to a full blown pandemic, and I got back to England. And I told my wife, "Look, listen, this this thing is coming. And it's gonna hit. It's gonna hit big." And so we just bought all this uh, audio equipment and uh, invested in that, and just just la- just really committed to this lateral uh, side yeah. of the thing, and which we had always done. I'd always earned my money that way. It is what allowed me to say no to a lot of acting work that would have held me back you know, yeah. roles that would have held me back well let me let me ask you if i can so yeah um so i'll so let you get back to <laughs> <laughs> no no i think it's i think it's great advice i mean if you can look ahead and then make investments to, to pivot really quick but with with home for example yeah um you know there's there's some really I, the thing i love about british shows and so um bo knows this about me and so he knows that i love british comedies yeah. i like british dramas i like i like british stuff because the best way I've heard it explained is in America, the main character, especially in comedies, the main character is a loser and everything goes right for them. <laughs> in Britain, the main character is a loser and nothing goes right for them. Yeah. And so uh, I, I, I'm not saying that that's actually in any way representative of your story. Yeah. That's just one of the things where it's like, I like to watch things kind of go wrong and yeah. then not come out as the hero. Like, yeah. like, I mean, the conversation we're having now is just like, I just, I don't know what it is, but 
when, when I'm, when I, what the clips that I was able to get over here in Canada, um, <laughs> you know, uh, uh, challenge, like some really challenging aspects of it, you know, in terms of, in terms of anti-immigration, uh, anti-immigrant uh, or refugee racism of, uh, of, you know, the struggles that one faces to be able to try and get a better life to find out that maybe it's not that much better um, to, to people opening up their home and welcoming mm-hmm. you in. And it's just like, I feel like it's the type of show I would love, but when you get this, so you got, you got, you, you, you get yeah. the part and they hand you the script. How do you break down a character like that? Like, how do you go about doing that? So my main way, my main way, and I go back to the, the first thing I said about the iceberg where you, like I said, which is popular now, but, but it's um, something I've always said, which is you need the mountain of work underneath the water that nobody sees so that when somebody, you know, ships captains know what is an iceberg and what is just a floating chunk of ice, hmm. they, they can tell there, there, there are ones you can sail right through and, and crush them. And there are ones that if you sail into them, you, you crack the hull and crack the ship and you drown and captains know which one is a chunk of ice and which one is an iceberg. Uh, or people on the work on the ships. And, and um, I, I heard that a long time ago, and I love that idea. Uh, there's, there is just something about that floating block of ice that tells you that there is a whole mountain underneath it. And like, oh, oh my goodness, I just had a light yeah. bulb moment listening you say that because yeah. I didn't know how to ask you how subtly you sometimes play parts. This, you know, uh, I think I think you see it in the first few minutes of your Criminal UK episode. Thanks, man. Where yeah. you don't say very much, like you just you don't say yeah. very much, and yet you can see something underneath. And and I yeah, I, th- I yeah, feel yeah. like I just so got a glimpse into your process. Yeah, that's exactly that's exactly what it is, man. I mean, I'm I I, I won't say I I do it perfectly every time, but I definitely try to fill up my my experience of the part, fill up my brain, my thinking, my educational my knowledge of the world of uh, the, the character I, f- I fill it up as much as possible with things that i know are going to be useful to me emotionally mm. and then i more often than not just don't use them just let them go and just mm. trust that they're in my psyche now so if i want to as a result um and I highly recommend this to everybody in every whatever field it is, because this this works. If you, if I want to play, so in criminal, for example, okay, I I played a, a, a suspect in a, in a criminal case, getting arrested. He's a, a truck driver, accused of uh, driving uh, uh, his truck across the border into the UK from Europe, smuggling people in the truck. The total opposite of the other show you're in, basically. Yeah, exactly, exactly. In fact, you know, if because of this niche sort of aiming thing, you can track my parts over a sort of three-year period. Where they, it's basically a, this journey. Like I play a Syrian people smuggler and Jack Ryan following. Uh, then I play a refugee who smuggles himself into England and home, followed by a truck driver smuggling refugees. Like it all, <laughs> it all leads to the thing. But um, so to play that uh, truck driver, for example. Uh, what I'm trying to say is I, I can, re- I can research things that ha- have nothing to do with the story and, 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 they, and they serve me very, very well. So there's a the difference between uh, what I call developmental research and fundamental research. In fact, there's an old, I think it's a French president. Is it just called this now? Somebody, somebody said this thing about the difference between developmental research and fundamental research and how we needed more fundamental research. But my, process is basically fundamental research mm. whereas developmental research for example if you invent a spoon and you apply developmental research in a hundred years you've got a million different types of spoons if you apply fundamental research to it in a million in a hundred years you have spoons forks knives bowls different eating utensils cups it just it grows because mm. you're you're developing the fundamentals of what this thing is so if you're going to play a part and you apply a fundamental approach to the research, what you're, what I'm really wanting to research is the feeling of being interrogated, mm-hmm. the 
uh, psychological uh, effects of being accused of something. Um, I'm going to need a lot of information about my feelings towards my family because that's going to have to be really, really, really strong so that any suggestion that I'm going to go to prison could affect me a certain way. So actually what I'm going to research is um, just the most beautiful, wonderful day out with a family, picnics and things and parks and all, all the things that are at risk for that. All the things that are at risk. Situation. Exactly. Mm. Yeah. I want to learn a bit more about my kids develop, get that really, really solid. Um, then, uh, then there is the practicality, you know, driving a truck. What's that like? But then let's go even further, you know, um, the idea of, uh, and, 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 and so on and so forth. And you sort of expand out from your part. And the and the, and the, and the um, specifics of your part, and you just branch out. You know what I mean, and go even further. Like I played a I played a czar, a Russian czar, uh, in for in, in a play once, and all my research was about uh, a bouncer, bouncers, being bouncers at a club. Why? And that's, but it's, that it's seems so, so abstract. It seems so abstract, right? When I when I say it like that, the two are so far apart. But f- fundamentally, there is the same thing: a bruiser working mm-hmm. at the at the front of a door mm-hmm. uh protecting the people inside living a life of violence mm. when you apply that when you transpose that onto a czar of russia yeah. it starts to feel like the same it starts to make sense it starts to make sense mm. and um and it's inspiring it can inspire you to play the czar and so that's that's the kind of stuff i'm talking about like it's it's i urge everybody to try and not be afraid of where you get your inspiration from because it's part and parcel of researching every facet of what you might need um, and, and reaching wide because it's all going to be the, but anyway, if you do that really well, if you spend your time filling your brain with all that, no one, it'll never come out. I mean, it's the, the, the amateur or the beginner will try and show you the audience Hey man, I've got this whole research about um, about uh, about being a bouncer, you know, or whatever. Or right. um, if they would even think to do so, though. Even if you think, you know, you're, 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 you'll you'll try and f- most people I, try and get all their research onto the onto the screen or onto the you know to, in into their work. But what you right. want to be doing is to just drop it. You've done all that. You've, right. you've experienced many, you've emotionally had a little snapshot of all these different places. This is, this is such an interesting yeah. topic though, because, you know, I struggle between, so I don't read very much, but when I read, I always love it. Hmm. And so the, the problem for me is I actually just don't think when I have free time to read. So it's like, okay, hmm. I got to crack that because every time I open a book, I'm just like, I'm there with the highlighter. I'm like, oh my goodness, this is amazing. This is yeah. so great. It's mind blowing. I love it because I, I don't read uh, fiction. So it's always gotcha. something that I'm learning and developing and things like that. Um, and so it used to bother me though, that I, that I know that I would forget these things. It still bothers me. It bothers me to take the time to read something, have a mind blowing <laughs> thing to highlight it, to want to write down the notes and my wife the other day was like, Mark, what are you doing? Like, you can see, like, I got stacks of books everywhere. She's like, what are you, you keep ordering books. Like, you never, what are you doing? And it's like, it's like no, I have, my a, wife says. I have a system, right? So I listen to the book on tape. Yeah. And then if it's really captivating, I buy a hard copy and I go back to the parts that matter. I highlight them. And then in my mind, I'm going to take notes and I'm going to, but, but really I actually don't do anything with them. But after she said this, and I was thinking about it, I realized that it doesn't matter because I'm, I'm absorbing it. And so it means something to me in this moment, but I'm going to be able to recall it, or I'm going to be able to synthesize it or distill it, yeah. or I'm going to read five books and I'm going to go, Oh, they all kind of point to the same thing, yeah. which is this over here. That's not even yeah. in any of the books. No, it's in. And there. so, and so it's just what, what you're, what you're actually telling me is that not only should I not feel guilty about this, but there's actually a method to the madness of just, of just absorbing and synthesizing yeah. so you can call on it when you need it. Yeah, because what happens is, is people start to say things to you like, man, um, you get so much depth. Um, and, and you're like, really? All I, all I did was say the lines. You know, that's the, you know that story about Floyd, May- Floyd Mayweather uh, wanting to hang out at Triple H, um, 
Triple H was trying, saw him right before a fight and he's trying to give him some space and, and Floyd's like, no, 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 chill, chill, chill. And, uh, and he said something like, if I'm not ready now, I'm not going to be like, right. I've already done the work. Right. Which is why, which is why cramming the day before actually doesn't help you <laughs> doesn't because, help, because no. if you're not ready the day before, you're not going exactly. to probably be but ready. That's what I mean by this kind of d- doing this kind of preparation where you fill, you fill yourself up with info that you then drop mm. and trust that it's in there mm. means that you can just show up and pfft, it's, it's, it, you know, you're not actually working. You just do your thing. You've already done the work. Um, you know, and then everybody sort of pats you on the shoulder and goes, crap, that was, a, how did you, that's amazing, blah, blah, blah. But actually you've already done, you've already done the, you've already done the stuff. And sometimes, you know, I'm about to work with a, a really big director and I think I can say, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't, <laughs> don't get into trouble on yeah. my podcast. No, You're about I'm to work happy. with a big director. Let's, let's I'm about to work. I'm about to work with Ridley Scott. Directed, you know, yeah. Ridley Scott. Ridley Scott. Yeah, which is wonderful. It's a huge thing. But he shoots one or two takes, maybe one take, two takes if you're lucky. So if you don't know what you're doing, <laughs> if you have already haven't already done the work, then you're, then you're done. Right. You know. Yeah, that's, 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 that's what I would say about the research and how I approach those parts. And approaching Sammy, yes, God, I'm sorry, but I, I tend to waffle a lot when I'm, no. when I'm excited about the topic. No, um, no, but say, so approaching- a few things that, I, that I've that I really marvel about, about the character. So, so the first thing is, cause I always, I always want to give credit where it's due. You know, the first thing I fell in love with is of course the writing, but, yeah. but the yeah. writers are responsible for the writing. Mm. What you, what you did with, with physicality, with um, just, you, you look like with, with the, the, the clips that I saw, you just look like the most open, progressive, um, heartwarming person that I just, I mean, I, I haven't seen the whole show, so I don't know if there's turning points and all these things, but yeah. you just seem wonderful, man. Thanks, like, man. Yeah. I mean, look, the, a lot of that is in the writing. I, I, I always, ha- I always hand it over to, to the writing. Uh, and, and, and I always say, you know, Rufus has that Rufus Jones wrote, wrote home and he has that sort of um, kindness in, in his bones and so it, it leaks onto the page. And so some, I felt like all you have to do is say the lines and it's all going to come across. And, but, but because he wrote it at a time where in England, these, mm. this anti-immigrant sentiment was at its, at its sort of highest. And Brexit was about to have, the vote on Brexit was about to happen. And so as a result, the campaign, the Leave campaign was really fueling the fire and you had uh, commentators who get so much airtime in england they're always on television writing you know getting paid handsomely to write articles in newspapers calling refugees cockroaches you know and suggesting suggesting taking the machine guns out and gunning them in the water and like just insanity um and stuff that made uh, or at least made roof you know made me really angry made rufus very angry and rufus just uh, r- wrote this this thing as a response to that, which is effectively showing an, a refugee coming to England and they're not what you think they are. They're actually a truly decent person. Mm-hmm. Um, and one of my favorite uh, moments in home is when my character Sam, because uh, Rufus plays a character and the, the writer plays a, uh, one of the other main characters plays a, a character named Peter, who is, kind of right-wing conservative doesn't want refugees here did vote for brexit so on and so forth and and we have finally have a showdown and i i say to him you know um you're threatened by me and he goes no no and i said no you're not threatened by me because we're different you're threatened by me because we're the same and i give him this speech the, the, there's a speech that precedes it which is what you need to understand is that people like me are not so different from you we're the middle class like we left our satellite tvs we left our uh widescreen televisions and you know, right. this whole thing you know like my the pump on our in our swimming pool broke um uh I, you know the hdmi cable between my my flat screen and my satellite television uh, got broken i never had time to fix it you know we buy olive oil we do you know our fancy olive oil and this and that and this and that like we're the ones that could afford to leave 
Right. That everybody else that stayed behind, that you could you have no clue what their lives are like. Um, but we are the the middle class, just like you. That's who these refugees are, because no nobody else could afford it. You know, it costs money to flee a country. You know, to get smuggled into another country. Um, and that's that was the cornerstone of this thing, which is these these refugees are not faceless strangers that fit into the same homogenized box. Um, they are individuals with their own thing. I mean, imagine, imagine if tomorrow the UK or Canada, something happened, God forbid, and we all had to go elsewhere. Mm-hmm. They, the rest of the, you know, that other country we landed would literally think of you and I as this just cardboard cutout definition, Im- refugee, right. immigrant, you know what I yeah. mean? Asylum seeker. Yeah. Um, they are not all the same person. They are it's, completely it's so, different so from each other. Interesting because my grandmother passed away a few years ago, but the very last thing, um, well, the second last time we were able to talk to her, my daughter was doing a school project and we had to ask five questions. We had to find someone, um, you know, uh, we had to find someone who was an immigrant to Canada mm-hmm. and we had to ask them, you know, why did you leave and what were you seeking? And just five simple questions. And I recorded, I recorded it so my daughter could take notes. So I have this recording of my grandmother answering. And she talked about my grandfather. He grew up in Lithuania um, during the war, was a refugee to Germany. So he was a German in Lithuania who came to Germany during the war as a refugee. And, and I said, and we were like, well, why didn't you stay in Germany? And she's like, well, they couldn't because he was a refugee. And we're like, I, I don't understand. Like, it's just, it's just yeah. you know, we just don't, I don't understand. What do you mean? What do you, what do you mean? It's like, well, mm-hmm. like he had to go somewhere else because he couldn't get away from the stigma of being a refugee. And it's like, he could come to Canada and in Canada, he wasn't a refugee. He was, he was an immigrant and, and that apparently high, holds a much higher status. Um, and I just, I, I think about that. I thought about that for the last few years because I don't understand. I, I don't as, as like a white middle-class guy who grew up in a, in a very wealthy nation. I guess I just don't understand that. And what I realize as you tell this story and as I watch the clips and what have you, that um, I know it's there. I know the struggles are there, but man, do you guys make it feel so real? So, oh, yeah. uh, so I just, you know, I, I think it's amazing. I think it's yeah, amazing. Thanks, what you do, really. Yeah, it's good. I mean, it's, 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 it's a, it's a, you know, it's a, it's one of those feel good uh, shows. The producers make other, the producer who, 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 um, the guy who produced the show makes other shows that are feel good, like detectorists and, you know, inside number nine and all these good, uh, Although inside number nine is a bit more a different thing, but he's, you know, Detectorists is a be- another beautiful show, but it's on HBO max. I don't know if you get it in Canada. Home is on, is on there. Um, otherwise, um, otherwise I think there are DVDs around, but some, but yeah, it's, it's having, doing something like that where, where you have this sort of good feeling behind it while trying to present a subject that is in many place is controversial and this is the thing the 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 result of the show is that i had people from very much the right of the political spectrum spectrum contacting me and saying how much they loved sammy because Mm -hmm. of the very reasons you just described um and and if you think about what, (laughs) what i just said there people from the right the far, you know, the real right, right of the political spectrum saying, I love this character. I love this refugee. I can just imagine what they say. I love this character. I love this refugee. If just all refugees were like yeah. Sammy, I'd welcome exactly. them all in. Oh, 100%. <laughs> there, there was that. But uh, as like my family pointed out, you know, the, these particular four people I, I, that I have in mind, um, as my family pointed out, they, uh, they might not ever have said a kind word like that. Mm-hmm for an immigrant either fictional or or yeah. real in their yeah. entire life yeah um and, and and like i'm a believer is in 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 once something is in the brain it's in there and it just starts to work away and i think if they if somebody who's consistently got these negative opinions of refugees goes i love sammy i love that sammy sammy's the name being the name of my character love that character I believe it goes into the brain and it works its way <laughs> into yeah. different recesses and places. Do you know what I mean? It. it does have an effect. Yeah. Um, well, listen, you guys are, you guys are doing your part of, 
of, you know, what, what Will and Grace was able to do for, for the gay community, you know, within America, sure. um, you're, you're a part of, you know, and, and, and what, what Me Too needs to do and what all of the movements need yeah, to do. Yeah. You're, you're, you're a part of it. And, um, yeah. I think stories are so important. So yeah, honestly, yeah. man, thank you so much for, for, for sharing and everything. Hey man, of course, of course. Yeah, my, my pleasure. My absolute pleasure. Can you tell? that I was having a ton of fun with that conversation or what? Oh man, I could talk to Yusuf all day, every day. Okay, key takeaways for me. Number one, don't let your ego drive you to focus on the very thing that everyone else is also gunning for. You have a far better chance of long-term success if you ignore the masses and really go the opposite direction. Focus on number two, focus on number three, go the other way. Number two, accept that what makes you different may actually be the thing that gets you the opportunity. And number three, in whatever you're doing, whatever you're doing, do it because you love it, because you enjoy it, and then don't stop. Remember, those of us who have something to prove, we can show the world, we can show ourselves, that little voice of doubt up here, that we have what it takes to make it happen. But you have to think big. You've got to be bold and you must say yes. If you need more Next Level Conversations, you have got to watch the one, the only Iron Cowboy. Click on the link right over there. I'll see you there. On to, to gratitude and the things that we get to do. I don't have to go on a 140 mile bike ride. I don't have to do Eco Challenge. I get to do those things. It changes the mindset when you're out there suffering.